Automakers have to greatly improve the fuel efficiency of their vehicles. But what technology are they going to use to hit the government's stringent targets? And just as importantly, are we going to be able to afford that technology? To help me get to the bottom of those issues, I have three experts joining me today. Christopher Thomas is the vice president of Borg Warner's Advanced Engineering Group. Roger Clark is the senior manager of the Energy Center at General Motors. And Mircea Gradu is the vice president in charge of transmission, powertrain, and driveline engineering at the Chrysler Group. We'll be back to talk to them in just a moment. Underwriting for Auto Line this week is provided by. We are IAC Group, a global tier one supplier of vehicle interior solutions that span the rapid, ever-changing needs of today's industry. From interior design and engineering to manufacturing and delivery, IAC, our heritage, your advantage. From the Auto Line Studios, here is your host, John McElroy. Thanks for joining us for AutoLine this week. We're really going to dive into this issue of fuel economy and what it's going to take for the automotive industry to be able to hit fuel economy standards. And of course, I've got a great program or panel today. Roger Clark from General Motors, Mercha Gradu from Chrysler, and Christopher Thomas from Borg Warner. Great all having you here with us on AutoLine this week. Our pleasure, John. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Roger, let me ta ta start with you. I mean, these fuel economy standards are, are tough right now, but especially after 2015, they really start to ramp up. The industry's got to hit an average of 54.5 miles per gallon by 2025. Can it do it? Yeah, well, that's going to be the big question. <laughs> and, you know, that's what we're working very hard on at General Motors. And we're looking at every possible option. And I can tell you that I believe the industry will do it. GM's always met these requirements, and, and we will find a way. The key is doing that in a way that customers will still want to buy the vehicles that uh, we produce. So that's really the big factor. Isn't that the key, Mertra, that it's not Absolutely. just a technology issue, it's can we get the customers the to buy it? It's the customer these? acceptance. And um, on that uh, note, you know, we, we certainly pursue various hybrid technologies. And as you, as you very well know, uh, there is no crystal ball to tell us exactly which one, which one of those technologies will prevail um, in the in the long term. So uh, what we are doing, we are testing the market with um, uh, fleet vehicles that are currently um, exposing the customer, the end user, actually to um, um, issues that can occur in uh, uh, plug-in hybrid vehicles in other types of um, hybrids, including hydraulic hybrids, actually and in various vehicle segments. So uh, we plan also to diversify the penetration of these technologies by vehicle segment. Um, I think um, you know the, the news, um, Fiat and Chrysler now are benefiting tremendously from each other's uh, technologies and uh, we are the center of competence for the electric and hybrid technology at Chrysler. And Fiat uh, brought to the, to the table a lot of engine and transmission technologies that are extremely efficient in Europe. Uh, they are the um, um, vehicle manufacturer with the best CO2 um, at, at the fleet level, so I think we have a lot to learn and to apply from them. So, Chris, Borg Warner seems to be well positioned on both the engine and transmission side. I mean, for you guys, this CAFE standard must be just terrific. Well, yeah, Borg Warner, everything we do is really focused on fuel economy performance and emissions and, and making all of those better. So we have one of the broadest uh, portfolios of, of powertrain products. Uh, and again, all of, all of everything we do is focused on those, those three key items. And our engineers really know engines and transmissions, as, as you say, because our, en our engineers are working with the advanced engineering groups in each of the OEMs around the world. And so maybe we have a, a slightly different perspective than these guys, but, but we have uh, maybe a more global perspective mm -hmm. on what's happening. What I want to ask you about is turbocharged engines, sure. which seems to be all the rage these days, where automakers are putting in smaller engines yep. but turbocharging them. Yet I remember back to the 1980s, where if you put a turbo on an engine, it was like an on-off switch. Right. Bang! It came on like a hammer, yeah, and until yeah. it did, the, the thing didn't move. These new ones are, I, I, I'm astonished at how good they are and, mm -hmm. and how small the engines are. What have been the technologies that have made these new ones so good? Well, you know, but as you say, back in the 80s and 90s, turbocharging was really just for performance, or it was for a uh, maybe using a, 
a surrogate where you put a, uh, a turbocharged engine in a place where, you, where a vehicle, uh, the vehicle wouldn't have a V6. It, uh, so V6 the, could not fit, so exactly. you turbocharged so you, you the four-cylinder. Right. Four right. And it was really just a performance improvement. Mm -hmm. But there really wasn't much fuel economy improvement with that. What we're seeing now with the advent of variable cam timing and having, using that in those engines as well as direct injection, this is, this is what's really enabled this downsizing and boosting trend that you're seeing sort of sweep across the industry. But Gradu, isn't it also the combination with the transmission too? Because it's the total package. It definitely is, and I just wanted to give you, John, a, a perspective that's probably uh, more rare in your discussions because obviously you jumped on the engine turbocharging uh, technology, which certainly brings the, the engine downsizing uh, topic into the discussion, but uh, from the driveline and transmission perspective, and I know that uh, Chris is very much aware of this, uh, we work with, with the supply base uh, to try to actually um, improve on that side from the perspective of uh, wide uh, gear ratio spread, which allows us essentially to achieve the same type of things that uh, we achieve with turbocharging. Uh, it's another way of downsizing, if you want, at the powertrain level. And specifically to Borgwana, we have two technologies that um, um, are less known maybe by the end user in the market. One is the um, active transfer case technology, which in For all-wheel drive. For all-wheel drive product, which in conjunction with the front axle disconnect in real drive-based all-wheel drive systems like the one that we have on the 300 and charger or in the, in the trucks. I know the General Motors is uh, uh, applying the same technology in trucks. Uh, it allows us to disconnect the unnecessary portion of the drive line um, essentially, we operate an all-wheel drive or four-wheel drive vehicle in, in two-wheel drive mode when obviously the customer doesn't need the uh, benefits of all-wheel drive. And we gain the benefits in terms of efficiency and fuel economy um, of a, um, if you want, uh, uh, drive line with less capacity yeah, glasses. Yeah, and, sure. uh, yeah, so in other words, you can have all-wheel drive these days and it's not going to be quite the fuel economy penalty that it might have been Absolutely. in the past. That's right. right. The, the That's benefits right. are in the two to, to five percent range which are extremely significant if you if you look at, at the bank for the buck assessment which we all do yep. um, I think it's it's a tremendous uh, value in the technology the other aspect that I wanted to mention is um, the um, so-called mechatronic unit uh, which Borgwana provides for dual clutch transmissions in addition to the clutch technology and that also allows us to uh, improve on the efficiency of the transmission because dual clutch transmissions are extremely efficient uh, both in the wet clutch and dry clutch version of them. So those are two things that you know our friends at Borgwana are contributing with <laughs> and are less known than the turbocharging technology which is on all the billboards in Detroit. So that's uh, <laughs> you know maybe we should create some for transmission driveline technology as well. So and you yeah, must see absolutely the the, uh, the transmission is critical in that because as you downsize the engine you have limited amount of torque. It takes some time to build that torque in a turbocharger, but with the transmission improvements that we have today, you can get to the, uh, you can be operating at very low speed, which is critical for fuel economy. The, every 100 RPM on the cycle is worth almost eight tenths of a mile per gallon, mm -hmm. and then accelerate the engine very rapidly mm -hmm. when it's time to demand the, the power. So the integration of those technologies is critical, and we've been paying a lot of attention to that. Also, one thing that I really like what General Motors is doing these days is really gearing down its small yes four-cylinder right. engines. Yeah. As a point of example, I drove uh, the Chevy uh, Sonic recently, yeah. and at 70 miles an hour, this is with a 1.4-liter right. turbo right. engine. Right. It was only turning about 1,300 That's RPM, which floored <laughs> me. Is, is this a strategy that GM's going to use a lot more? This has been a strategy that I've uh, had for years, <laughs> and GM has is, is been embracing for but, a but long, time. But what changed? Because time. before, everybody said, well, but then if you try to accelerate, there's no power. and that, uh, That's the critical issue. You have to be able to provide the responsiveness. So you can't just have the engine be sitting there at really low speed, and then when it's time to accelerate, sit there flat and not respond. And so that's been the, the critical issue over the years. Mm -hmm. And today, with these newer technologies, we're able to make it respond fast so you can get the engine down, keep it down, but then when it's time to accelerate, accelerate very rapidly. Our, our Equinox has a 2.4 liter um, SIDI engine, and that improves What's SIDI? Our, uh, direct injection of the fuel into the cylinder. Okay, and just for those who may not know the, the, the terminology. Right, right. It, it, gives, it gives better torque and power. That 
particular vehicle in the past had a V6, and we were selling on the order of 80% V6 in those vehicles because it wasn't responsive. But with the new technologies, we got that engine size down with, with the four-cylinder. We're selling 90% four-cylinders now. And, and it's really been a win for us because with the responsiveness, you get the fuel economy in that vehicle and, and the responsiveness. Mm -hmm. And what changed, John, very specifically on the technology side, uh, we're talking about eight and nine-speed transmissions yeah. now. And when I, when I mentioned... Yeah, and I'm a guy who grew up with three-speed automatics right. or <laughs> manuals, and now we're right. up to nine-speed. Well, there's three some tens out whatever, there. Yeah. Is there a, oh, no, kidding. Right. Yeah. Well, there are some tens, but uh, again, there is a point of diminishing returns, so we, we are carefully assessing you know, the investment into a new technology from the benefit perspective. But the eight and nine-speeds, which are on the market, well, the um, eight-speed, in our case, is on the market right now in the Charger N300, you're getting a 331 mile per gallon fuel economy, and the first gear ratio is 4.7, and uh, you know overdrive is 0.6. So with that kind of spread, uh, you get to the point that uh, we were making earlier here, I mean the, the very low RPM at highway speeds, which gives you the uh, opportunity for very, very good highway fuel economy. So. What about continuously variable transmissions? Right now, at this snapshot in time, Nissan seems to be mm -hmm. almost the only automaker seriously committed to it, mm -hmm. not yeah. including the hybrids, the strong sure. hybrids, which need that. But, mm -hmm. I mean, the new Nissan Altima has got best-in-class fuel economy, and they mm -hmm. largely attribute it. There's a number of other things that went mm -hmm. along. To the CVT, where do you see the CVT ever making a comeback with other ma automakers? Well, I think the CVT has uh, kind of a, its its niche. Um, we're, we're, our view is that the dual clutch transmissions are, are going to grow much faster than CVTs, mm -hmm. and actually the good old fashioned planetary gear transmission, as Mercher mentioned, you're getting outstanding fuel economy on some of these vehicles with it. With it, when you start having eight and nine speeds, mm -hmm. and it really and it, and it you know, allows you to enables you to to downspeed the engine. And, and really ha run those engine speeds to, uh, at much lower speeds on, and, and on that's the fuel economy cycle. It's, it's yeah. a system level, and, and Chris implied that, and we all yeah. say the same thing. It's, it's not a transmission technology, engine technology, vehicle. Yeah. It's yeah. all together, and um, yeah. certainly that, that's the key, how you integrate. So if Nissan has great results, they, they have it because they integrate very well the technology. Right. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely they do. Uh, Roger, uh, General Motors is doing a number of things, as you talked about, the, the louvers that close yeah. off the front end for better fuel economy, better aerodynamics that translates into to fuel economy as well. But um, are, is this the end of the V8 engine? Is this the end of, you know, normally aspirated engines without a turbo and all that or what? We are, we are going to find a way to make our uh, efficiency gains um, and still provide the customer with all the benefits that they expect out of their uh, vehicles. So I don't think it's the end of anything, okay? <laughs> I think that we're going to find uh, technological solutions and just to the point earlier, the integration of those solutions that will allow customers to have the vehicles that they love to buy and, and drive and, and, and enjoy and meet the fuel economy standards. So, um, uh, will, it, will it shift mix? Yes, I think you're going to see shifts in mix mm -hmm. and shift in, in things, but you're still going to see the diversity of vehicles that, that we have. Maybe not to the same extent that we have today, but I think you'll see very few vehicles uh, leaving, leaving the market. General Motors seems to be very committed to what it's calling e-assist, yes. where you have a, a smaller battery with an electric motor that gives some assist so you can use a smaller gasoline engine and get better fuel economy. Absolutely. I've got to believe this kind of approach is almost going to go completely across the board. Yeah, that, that's a good point. You know, what we're trying to do there is make uh, elements of hybridization affordable to everyone. And, and that's what uh, uh, we're working on hard with uh, trying to get the the cost effectiveness of all these systems optimized so that you can put them as base content on, on nearly every vehicle. Right, and start-stop technologies, are, I think, are, are key in uh, achieving a very good bang for the buck from the fuel economy perspective. Right. Customer acceptance, again, is a big deal with um, start-stop, yeah. and I think, um, you know, there are so many solutions uh, currently available that we cannot really predict which one will be the winner, but again, we are trying to understand the benefits of each and pre prepare for all of them. And, and from the transmission perspective, when you think about the voltage requirements in a um, start-stop vehicle, if you can find innovative solutions like um, hydraulic storage and uh, for the downtime uh, when the pumps are not working and you're not putting additional 
uh, electric loads on the vehicle, that's, that's a benefit. So the industry innovates tremendously in preparation for this for the application of start stop and other technologies but there is no um, unique clearly defined path we are trying to branch into all directions at this point so. yeah i, I think i think you're going to see that these first generation stop start systems are, are going to have problems there's there's going to be some nuances that people don't like what and is it about them chris because some seem very good they're they're seamless you don't even notice them some you know they come to a stop when you stop at a stop sign or a stop light to save fuel economy but when they start up, it sends a shudder through the car. Sure. Or sometimes I'm coming up to a stoplight and I get out and the engine turns off and, ooh, I got to go. And, and it, there's a hesitation there right. that I don't like. And, and there's, there's a variety of things that we're doing to, and, you know, we're innovating to try, try and solve those problems. One of the things we, we do for that, uh, that, that last issue that you just mentioned is we have a, a one-way clutch system that lets you re-engage the starter motor before the engine actually shuts down. And so then it restarts the engine much quicker and you don't get that hesitation. We also have an accumulator, to, mm -hmm. to Murcher's point, that lets you refill the clutch packs instantaneously so you don't have to wait for, or you don't have to run an electric pump or you don't have to uh, run the, uh, the trans wait for the engine to start and run the transmission pump. And we, and we, we should tell the audience, when we say wait for the engine to start, it's not like we're crossing our arms <laughs> and no, tapping no, our no, toes. I mean, it's yeah, still yeah. like that. Yeah. But a few milliseconds, it's, right. it's, it'll pick up on. Right, this, yeah. this, this hesitation you're talking about coming to a stop sign is like 300 milliseconds. To, right. So when, when the engine starts to shut down, you have to wait for it to shut down all the way before you can engage the starter motor. And so the one-way clutch is, is, is one way getting around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Merchant, we've been talking about hybrids. Mm -hmm. Chrysler did a deal with the EPA mm -hmm. to try and develop hydraulic hybrids. Mm -hmm where you store energy as hydraulic pressure, right. not necessarily in a battery. I haven't heard anything about it since. What's going on there? The project is on track, and as you described, the technology is the analog of electric energy storage in the hydraulic world. Essentially, you have an, uh, a motor and a pump, which are playing the role of a motor generator in the uh, electric world. And then um, you circulate energy with the, the most efficient pattern, if you want, or, or um, approach. Um, the key is um, hydraulic hybrids have the um, noise vibration and harshness uh, challenge and also weight challenges. So, so they're heavy and noisy, they is are what you're saying. They're heavy and noisy, if, uh, <laughs> yeah. And we are trying to address those key issues. Um, we have, um, as you know, the plan to demonstrate a technology in fourth quarter of this year, So, and we are on track with that. Um, and uh, it's going to be a uh, minivan application that will demonstrate the technology. We think it's, it's very appropriate because many reasons, but uh, um, it's, a, um, it's a serious system that I think will, um, will probably make the case for, for the technology. I hope will be refined enough to overcome all the issues that we were talking about uh, with customer acceptance. And while Chrysler is not in bigger trucks these days mm -hmm. necessarily, the EPA talks that this is a brilliant application for, for big delivery absolutely. vehicles. Yeah. I, I think it makes most sense on, on these big delivery vehicles mm -hmm. that already have hydraulic systems on them, right? right. I, if you think about a garbage truck that already has a hydraulic system built into it to, to <laughs> lift the, the, uh, the garbage cans up and, and compress the, the garbage in the back of it, that's the perfect place to use it because you, the hydraulic system's already there right. and you're not using energy from the engine to, to run a hydraulic pump. Mm -hmm. Not only that, there's so much room underneath those vehicles. Right. You can easily package the whole hybrid are, yeah. system. And weight and refinement maybe are less of an right. issue. You know, it's not quite that easy, yeah. John. Well, <laughs> okay. every, every, ve every vehicle has its packaging problems, yeah. even, even garbage yeah. trucks. Well, at least the noise problem can't be that much of an issue with a garbage truck. It depends if you get, get waked up by a garbage truck in the morning, you know, because the hydraulic noise, then uh, you might be dissatisfied. So there is always a challenge, as we, as we and, said. You know, the, the commercial the vehicle world is facing a lot of the same problems that, uh, that we're having on, on the passenger car side too. They have uh, fuel economy standards coming as well, both on highway and off highway. And uh, you know, we have those challenges uh, as well, given our portfolio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because Borg gets into well, well yeah, we have our, our, well. our you know our fan drive system. If you if you guys think about a, a fan on a Class Eight truck turning on, it, it's 60 horsepower. Wow. Right? So if you can af avoid having that that uh, that fan turn on. Uh, either, either with using some of our clutching technologies in, in the fan drive, or having the some, some very, uh, very good aerodynamics on the fan system, uh, that really can can improve the efficiency of the whole the whole system and and, and avoid the amount of parasitic losses you have there. Mm -hmm. You know, we were talking about 
downsized turbo engines yeah. uh, and how good they've become. I've got to believe you've got some tricks up your sleeve. We do. What you can do with turbochargers, next mm -hmm. generation. Well, there's a whole, we have a whole portfolio of turbochargers we have today from simple waste gated up through our regulated two stage. And actually, we've, we've put a, one system out with, with three turbos. But, um, you know, th that sort of what's happening today is this downsizing and turbocharging that, that you see sort of sweeping across the industry. And that's, that's going to continue for the next four or five years. But the next generation of turbocharging is going to include uh, cooled EGR, which is exhaust gas recirculation. And what you do is you take some of the exhaust back and, and put it into the intake. And when you do that, you really, uh, it really allows you to raise the compression ratio and improve the fuel economy of the engine. So, you know, we're seeing an additional 10% fuel economy mm. with that type of technology, incremental to the downsizing and, and boosting that you see, which is between 10 and 15% depending on the, uh, the implementation. So all this is kind of cascading. Sure. Mm. And we're, we're actually working on the, tech, the generation after that. Oh, my God. So uh. it's uh, where we're tying some of our, our valve train uh, competencies to really push what we're calling a valve event modulated boost, where we're actually using the... Mm -hmm. The, uh, the different exhaust valves to send uh, some of the high temperature, high energy uh, exhaust gas to the turbocharger and then also using the, the other one to then bypass the turbocharger so some of the pumping work that the engine does doesn't get into it. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, we're, we're, we're out there two generations ahead, in fact, and we're just sort of starting the next generation after that now. As an example of the uh, cooperation with Fiat, I mean, along the comments that Chris was making, uh, we are getting the uh, multi-air technology uh, from Fiat and apply that in conjunction with turbocharging on the 1.4 liter engine that uh, will be in various U.S. applications. Um, so uh, certainly the, the new Dodge Dart will benefit from that and the characteristics are um, spectacular in terms of the uh, fun to drive of the vehicle and, and kind of sportiness and um, the torque characteristic of the engine with this, this technology. So it's, it's turbocharging is again one, one keyword. There are many others that, uh, that help us in Big terms of factor. technology. We've yeah. been evaluating cool DGR, and we agree it's it's definitely yeah. a key technology. It's going to help expand the application of downsized turbocharged engines to a broader range. So it's really a fantastic uh, yeah. direction. Roger, how small will yeah. engines get? I, I got to believe today <laughs> probably the That's average displacement is two and a half liters, yep. maybe. Yep. That's a great uh, but, question. You know, we we see Ford coming out with a three-cylinder yep. engine, yep. at least in Europe. Fiat is doing a two-cylinder engine. Mm -hmm. Twenty twenty-five. Yep. Well, what do you think the average engine size is oh, going? I, I can tell you uh, it's been four cylinders are really the dominant engine these mm -hmm. days, and it never used to be that way. So they've been on a trend downward. It, it's very interesting, though. There was a recent study done at MIT, and they show that even the little crevice volumes uh, on the upside of the ring uh, uh, landing uh, has a big effect. And as you go down and down in size, that actually becomes a much greater effect, a, a larger part of the fuel economy. So we've got to be very careful when we downsize on, on all of those kinds of aspects and looking at all those details and make sure that we minimize those little crevice volumes uh, uh, and, and go down. So so to answer your question, how, how low can you go? Pro probably um, much below a, a liter uh, wow. in, in a lot of vehicles. Um, you know, today our, our cruise um, uh, has a 1.4 liter turbo, and people would have never dreamed of that, yeah. of that just a few years ago, right? And you, you drive the car, it's got tremendous responsiveness, uh, very good uh, acceleration. So um, we'll, we'll be going much lower. But I think that to, to answer your question about how low can you go, it's going to get down to can you launch the vehicle. And yes. because once you, once you launch the vehicle and the engine starts to spool up, you can build boost and that we can make lots of performance. But it's actually launching the vehicle that's going to be the, the limit. But doesn't that bring us back to what we were talking earlier on the e-assist, where you have a, a smaller battery, not as big as a strong hybrid or mm -hmm. certainly that an electric car. And, and, but we're, we're working on other technologies as well to Such solve as, that problem. Such as, can you give us any hint? I, well, <laughs> we haven't announced it yet. Apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me this, uh, and you guys chime in too. I remember the last energy crisis in the late 70s, early yeah. 80s, and everybody was going crazy with ceramics. Mm -hmm. Ceramic turbochargers, ceramic piston caps, valves, and all that sort of thing. Uh, is the ceramic thing, was that just a pipe dream? I think it was a pipe dream. <laughs> <laughs> the ceramics kind of have their place, but but uh, they're used in aircraft engines. Mm -hmm. But uh, to really be cost effective and 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 be able to make a, a turbocharger that that these guys can afford, that the end, end consumer can afford, probably not. 
And one of the other holy grails has been uh, electronically actuated valves. So instead of big springs and camshafts and <laughs> chains and all that, yeah. any hope for... You guys are just well, smiling. I don't think so. <laughs> I, no, I mean, if you look into the uh, multi-air system, it's actually um, infinitely variable controlled valve train done hydraulically, right. electrohydraulically, I should say. Mm -hmm. It's a very efficient solution. And mm -hmm. it's, but, uh, yeah. But so. I think to your point of, of actually using electrical energy to open the valves, uh, I, you know, the, the, you don't really appreciate a, a, an engine running with a camshaft until you don't have one, right? <laughs> that the valves don't do exactly what you're expecting mm -hmm. them to. Yeah. You, you really need to, uh, you have to put energy in to open them, mm -hmm. but then you also have to put, you never recover that energy, and you have to have put extra energy in to stop the valve hitting the seat too hard. So there's all this energy you're putting into the valve when it's, when it's, when you're uh, opening them that it's just not going to work. Every time you convert energy from one domain to the next, you lose some, That's too. Some and efficiency. The, the most right. efficient uh, mechanical device is an axle, okay? <laughs> As an efficiency of one. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, I, I need to uh, object slightly to your <laughs> comment because actually the efficiency is slightly lower than one, unfortunately. But we are working on improving that in a, in a big gain of 2% in the axle because it's so much downstream yeah. in the powertrain. Obviously, the efficiency of that axle applies to everything what you got from the engine transmission and so on. So it affects the overall balance. Um, it, it makes a big difference. So on that note, you know, we work with our partners at F and uh, actually... 2% uh, fuel economy in axles, we are very happy to translate sometime to one mile per gallon. And you unfortunately, know, you know. on that note, we're going to have to stop right here. But Roger, Mercha, and Chris, thanks so much for coming in. And I want to thank all of you for having joined us on AutoLine this week. Underwriting for AutoLine this week has been provided by... We are IAC Group, a global tier one supplier of vehicle interior solutions that span the rapid, ever-changing needs of today's industry. From interior design and engineering to manufacturing and delivery, IAC, our heritage, your advantage.